celebration of your heart, ending a year, reminding yourself that God is good, that his mercies endure forever, that he's never going to let us down. Come on, church.
Welcome to Church at the Crossing. We are so glad that you chose to worship with us today. If this is your first time, thank you so much for joining us. We have something special for you that you can find out at our Connect Center outside after service. We have connection cards and prayer request cards located in your worship guide and online. If you have updated information, please fill that out and let us know what the new information is. Also, if you have a prayer request, we have a team that will pray over those every single week. You can follow today's sermon notes on the YouVersion Bible app or in your worship guide. Every Wednesday at 6.30 p.m., we have our Wednesday night Bible study. It's an amazing time to have some small group discussions, go through some amazing series, and there's something for everybody all ages. Child care is provided. Every fourth Sunday at 6 p.m. is Connect Night. This is your chance to meet the leadership, see our vision of the church, and also see what your next step is here at The Crossing. We love connecting with you guys, and churchatthecrossing.tv is one of those ways that we do that. 
There you can fill out a connection card, listen to our sermons, give the tithes and offerings, and also find out more information about small groups. Pastor John and Brandon go live on Facebook every Thursday night at 8 p.m. This is their way of keeping us updated about what's going on at The Crossing. Church at The Crossing. We exist to participate in moments of grace. One of the things he said, if you have been around The Crossing for any amount of time and you're still like, I want to do something, I don't know what my next step is, Connect Night is a great place to to really take your first step. We have one every fourth Sunday, and so that falls into January. I want to say it's January 24th. I don't have a calendar, but it's the fourth Sunday. If that's the right date, then I did really good there. If not, just uh, figure out the date. But anyways, you can, uh, you can sign up for Connect Night. That's just uh, letting us know that you're coming. It doesn't mean that you're signing up for membership of the church or anything like that. It just lets us know that we need to prepare to have you here. But we serve a dinner at that night. So even if you don't want to join the church, but you want free dinner, that's a, that's a good thing. We've had good dinner in the past. We've done Dickie's Barbecue. Yeah. So I threw a curveball. Y'all thought I was going to say a different restaurant. Didn't you? <laughs> the Lord has freed me of that. Um, but we, we, we've done Olive Garden and things like that. So we just want to feed you and uh, tell you about our vision, our values, um, our structure. So we'd love that opportunity in January. Y'all, I've got to just get settled in. i got communion left over from Christmas Eve. <laughs> ADHD is a real thing, guys. Go clean that off. <laughs> Moment of honesty. When pastors leave communion and we use unleavened bread, we can only take a little bite of it because then we have to talk. You know what I'm saying? Like, one time I did communion and I, I ate the whole body of Christ. <laughs> and, uh, and I was just waiting to get to the juice. You know what I'm saying? It's like I was choked up and I couldn't talk. So that's why I have a little left over. Um, also, don't ever preach a message drinking orange juice. I learned that the hard way. Orange juice dries out in your mouth as well. So um, if anyone's into public speaking, I just wanted to settle you guys in. <laughs> but here's the deal. Uh, I think it's interesting that we're finishing out a year. Now, um, our prayer and our serve team, we have a moment together before church starts where we worship together and we pray and we kind of set the tone for the day. And let me just be honest with you, like I'm so excited that we still have time in 2018. Well, why, John, why are you excited? Because the, the Bible says that, 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 that he's faithful to complete the work that he started, that better is the end of a thing than the beginning of a thing. And so a lot of times, if we're just honest, don't we just kind of jump into the next year in these last couple of days, we just kind of skirt through them like, oh, let nothing else bad happen. Let's start 2019 fresh. And I'll tell you that the, the God who started the year is the same God who's going to finish the year. <laughs> and so there's some things that we're still holding on to and we're believing God for and we're believing that he's going to do. And so we're starting a new series on the last Sunday of the year. And I'm excited about this series because we've entitled this series, Our Values. And so even if you don't come to Connect Night, over the next four weeks, we're going to give you our values. And I love this graphic for anyone that's been here for any amount of time. Y'all know what that graphic is? Mint That's mint chocolate chip. That's good. I just want to sing the king of my heart again. Father, you are good. Um, for those that are wondering, like, does your church celebrate ice cream? No, we don't celebrate ice cream. We love ice cream. But just to give you a simple analogy, and this is kind of how our values um, tie in. When, when uh, I stepped in as lead pastor in uh, September 2017, we fasted. We prayed over what this would look like. We prayed over vision. And uh, I'm a very simple thinker. Um, God speaks to, to me in ways that, that I, I receive the message well. And restaurants and food seem to be a good thing for me. So um, if for the sake of the analogy, um, Jesus is like Baskin Robbins. Okay? There's 31 flavors offered up on a Sunday morning in any given church, you, 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 right? There's a ton of churches, amazing churches in Dothan meeting right now that offer a different worship experience. You know what I'm saying? Like there's, there's, there's ones that, that, that have a little bit more traditional approach or this approach or that approach. Here's the thing. I love all the expressions that are expressed as long as God's getting the glory and getting the honor and his name is above everything else. I love it. Um, I know that we've been called specifically to be one flavor. One flavor. I'm not trying to be a buffet of ice cream on a Sunday morning. Well, you don't do this, John, or the church doesn't do that. Well, there are some that do, and, and I could gladly lead you to Rocky Road or to Orange Sherbert or whatever flavor you want to go with for your analogy. But because I'm the pastor of the church, I chose the analogy, right? And so it's mint chocolate chip. <laughs> and, uh, and we know that God's called us to be mint chocolate chip. So what does that mean? Well, it means that mint chocolate chip is the ingredients 
if you will, uh, of the core values, the expression of God through the community known as Church of the Crossing. And so we are sold out to our values and to our vision. And, and, and if, if it's not your flavor, that's okay. We still love you and want to be friends and we'll see you in heaven. You walk into your denominational door and I'll walk into mine and then we'll wave when we get into the same room. It's okay. So I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not saying that we're the greatest flavor of the 31, but I am saying that this is our flavor. And the reason this is important is because I believe that God's called us to be a specific expression of himself. And we've got to honor that. We've got to be true to who he's called us to be. Why? Because it's tiring and it's, it, 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 it's, uh, it's exhausting being someone or something that God never called you to be. So we're not trying to imitate someone else's flavor. We're perfecting our own. And so we're mint chocolate chip. How does that fit in with you? Well, if you join the crossing or connect with the crossing, you're helping us perfect the ingredients. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's why we meet as a staff and we have meetings and we're like, yo, how's things going? Well, it tastes a little too minty. We've got to bring something else for the palate. You know what I'm saying? And so we want to bring balance to the flavor that God's called us to be. And what helps us with that is our values. So over the next four weeks, we're going to unpack four statements that we as a church hold dear and dear to our heart, and it's our values. You can find these values on our website at churchthecrossing.tv. There's four statements, so there's no surprise of what the next four weeks are going to be. They are in order from the first all the way down. And so this morning, we're starting this off, and it's important to us because here's the deal. Our values as a church, and here's also true, our values as individuals, they're what makes us, well, us. I'm saying, like, have you ever been around a different set of values than maybe the ones that you hold to yourself? Isn't it a little different? It's, it's, right? Like, it's, it's like, well, we, we do this a, a little different. We, yeah, like, I, I'm not even trying to make it super deep yet. <laughs> um, but, like, for example, I ate at a friend's house, um, and they value eating food before they give you a drink. Right? It's weird. <laughs> But, but, like, that literally, like you had to eat the meal and then you got a drink afterwards because they found out that if you, you, you drink too much liquid, then you won't eat the food. And so I struggled through that meal, y'all. Because, like, right, like uh, even before I lived in the South, I think I was Southern. You know, it's a very Southern thing to always have a drink on you. <laughs> I, I learned that when we went to New England. Like I asked for a to-go cup in New England, and they were like, for what? <laughs> Seriously, I was like, well, for a drink so I could take it home with me. Like, well, we have kids' cups. Like, no one takes drinks home. So, like, I always have to have a drink. So I sat through this meal for, like, 20 minutes. And, and you know, I'm, I'm not even going to say my friend's name because he may be watching online. But, you know, the chicken was a little dry. Um, <laughs> come on, anyone have dry chicken and you just need a drink? Yeah, well, go around someone whose values are not to give you a drink until after your meal. <laughs> so I excused myself to the bathroom, like, 14 times. I'm drinking out of the faucet just trying to get things together. <laughs> But this is why it's important. Our values make us us. And so let me say a few things about our values. If you're taking notes, uh, they were given out in the worship guide, or you can follow along in the, on the YouVersion app. You can click on events and go to Church of the Cross. And here's the first thing for your first fill in the blank. Um, our values, they're what chart the course. And so we may not know the exact parameters of where God is leading us, but we know that our values are what chart the course. Our values are also etched in our heart. They're what we hold to. Our values, it's the fiber of our DNA. And so we won't get away from our values. And I need to tell you this now because we, we need to reiterate it over and over and over again. We need to be reminded of our values because as seasons change and as things change, we've got to know who we are. Because here's the deal. I don't want to change with every change that comes along. Does that make sense? Like, like God's going to lead us into new seasons, but he's called us to be the person that he's called us to be. He didn't call us to just change with every like, like new wind that flows into the church or whatever. Like I know who I am in Christ. My identity is hidden in him and so is this church's values. And so we know that God has incredible plans for us as a community and as a body. We're on an incredible journey. An incredible journey. If you've been around for the past year and a half, two years, um, it, it doesn't even look the same or feel the same. God's doing something. There's momentum behind it. We're moving forward. And so uh, here's the deal. Uh, we see that, that Abraham takes this journey. And, and, and faith, let's just be honest, it is a journey. Like, faith is a journey. It's not this destination we land on. It's the, it's, it's the journey we continuously find ourselves on. We, we see it this way in Abraham's life. He had a willingness to go where God called him, even if he didn't know the destination. I wonder if anyone in here this morning is willing to go where God calls you, even if you don't know the destination. 
Like, for the adventurer, that sounds exciting. For the planner, you're like, what? Like, like I don't even come to church unless I've already mapped out the route. Like, I know what road I'm turning on. Hebrews 11.8 says it this way, By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place that he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he didn't know where he was going. Like, like that, that's faith and that's a journey. There's seasons in my life and there'll be seasons in your life where you are going wherever God calls you. And in moments and in times, you may have no clue what that looks like. Some of us may be in that season right now. <laughs> Like, I'm in this transitional season. I'm, 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 I'm not sure what college I'm going to go to or what job I'm going to land or what relationship I'm going to end up in. Come on, singles. What's up? That was for y'all, right? Yeah. Well, as a youth pastor and, and growing up as a pastor's kid, like, y'all remember hearing all that stuff about dating, coming up in church, like, you know, first date Jesus and then the rest will follow. And I have a 14-year-old that has discovered there's more to life than Fortnite. So, is he in here? Good. Y'all just pray for me. Pray for the dowdy home. I'm trying to help this kid out. But I know that God's leading us into a new season. And as a church, our values chart the course. They etched on our heart, and they're the fiber of our DNA. They're what we hold to. And so here's what I'm telling you. Over the next year, ending 2018 and going into 2019, things may look different. We might experience some change. We might see some things look a little different in this season to come. But even if things change on the outside, we are true to who we are on the inside. We will always be mint chocolate chip. The packaging may change. It may have new colors or whatever. But we will be true to what God's called us to be and who he's called us to be. And so as we step towards what God has for us, I want to never forget our values. And that's why we're taking these next four weeks to just, just lay them out for you guys and talk about them. And this morning, I'm going to spend our time together unpacking our, our very first value as a church. If you've been on our website, you know the value. And here's the value. Jesus is our message. All right, you good? Let's pray. Let's finish. Just kidding. But Jesus is our message. Well, why is that important, John? Because I believe... At the, at the heart and the foundation of a church, if anything else is our message, we are missing the point of being a church. God didn't call us to be a country club. God didn't call us to, to be the, the next coolest thing to show up in Dothan. What he has called us to be as followers of his son is, is those that would take the gospel message of Jesus Christ and present it to the world. I told my friends last night, and, and, and you may, this is your Jesus juke moment with John. On Sunday mornings, if you give me a platform, a pulpit, and a mic, I'm going to talk about Jesus. Well, John, we need help with our marriages and we need help with our money and our finances. Okay, we'll do them in small groups. But if you give me an opportunity to present the gospel, it's the gospel that's going forward. Why? Because that's the only thing that changes a life is the gospel. It's not my opinions. It's not what I can put together to make you feel good emotionally about where you're at. It is the gospel of Christ, cross, crucified, resurrected that changes the sinner's mind of the season that they're in. And as a church, that's what we do. And as a church, that's who we are. At the foundation of what we do, if it is not Jesus Christ-centered, I'm wasting my time as a pastor. God would have called me to be a motivational speaker instead. So if you put me on a mic and invite me to talk about something, I'm going to talk about Jesus. And I'm going to preach about Jesus and I'm going to teach about Jesus. Why? Because that's what changed everything for me. I mean, I, I've sat in churches my entire life. I was born in 1983. My dad's been in ministry since 82. I've heard message after message after message after message. And to be honest, I couldn't tell you the message, like, like, like the one that changed me, but I can tell you the person that did, and his name is Jesus. And we can't get away from that, church. We live in a day and an age where we just want to teach Jesus as a cool philosophy, not as a person with power and presence. And we won't be that as a church. Unapologetically, we'll double down on our stance to let God be God and let us be us. Humbled, submitted to what he's called us to do. Is that good? We good? Amen? All right, let's keep moving. Y'all, for real, like we could have church this morning. I don't care if you stand up and run and yell or whatever. I, I do care. <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> Unless you invite me with you to go on a 20-second praise break. But here's the deal. Paul understood that Jesus is the centerpiece of every message. 
Everything that he gives us. See, the other three values that we hold to, they have no weight to them if the first one isn't firmly in place. If, if, if our church goes off on some other things and we leave the first foundational one, we will stop existing to be a church and we'll just be a hangout on Sunday that we can check off and say we, we hung out with some cool people, we ate some food, we went home and felt good about our life. And there are seasons when the message of Jesus challenges everything about your life. I was, I was talking to another friend about this message of Jesus. You know, Jesus had a way of bridging the gap between the felt need and the spiritual need. Like, I don't want to be a church that's all connected to felt needs and never address the spiritual need. And I don't want to be a church that jumps straight to the gospel presentation without giving someone a loaf of bread and a fish so they could hear the message of Jesus. Does this make sense? It is the gospel of grace and truth together, perfectly embodied in a person named Jesus. So Jesus is our message. Everything we are and everything that we do is for his glory. It is not for us. I can tell you that our worship team, talent does not get you on our worship team. Character and anointing does. We don't just put people up here because they can play instruments. We, we, we look at what's been developed when no one else was looking. Why? Because that's what we see in King David, right? Like, like David was being developed in a field when everyone else was being pranced around in front. But the prophet came to town and they told Jesse, hey, you have the next king. Like he's one of your descendants. He's one of your sons. And so David knew that the, that, that the prophet Samuel was coming to anoint a king. Guess what David did? David was in the fields, watching over sheep, preparing for his moment. God has been preparing us behind the scenes. Why? Because this isn't about us. Our worship team would lead even if we put a, ble- like, like a, a sheet in front of them. But you couldn't even see who they are. Why? Because God gets all the glory. At the core of our church, Jesus is the centerpiece. Paul understood this as we said earlier. 1 Corinthians 2.1 This is what he says. When I came to you, I didn't come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Can you imagine it? how many sinners would change their mind about Jesus if we presented the gospel all the time? All the time. All the time. In John 20, we see an account. This is Jesus in his resurrected state. He appears to his disciples. This is what he says in John 20, 21. So he, he, he had died. He rose again. He shows up to his disciples. They're afraid. And so in verse 21, check out what Jesus says. He says, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. See, here's the deal with Jesus commissioning the disciples to proceed with the message. When he breathed on them, that phrase, Jesus breathed on them. The only other place you see it is in Genesis 2. When God formed man out of dust and he breathed air into their nostrils, the breath of God into the nostrils of man. The second time we see it is what we just read in John chapter 20. Well, why is that significant? Because that was the activation of the new covenant. That's where Jesus essentially is telling his disciples, now's the time. Go and testify. If you forgive, pe- if you forgive people of their sins. So did they have that power in themselves? No. What they did was they took the gospel message and at the core of the gospel message is that Jesus died for our sins. You know, I was talking to our serve team this morning and I asked him, what's the message of Jesus? If he's the, the center of of our church, and if Jesus is our message, well, what is his message? And collectively, <laughs> we would agree that the message of Christ is, is the cross, death, resurrection, the atonement of our sins paid for by one person, and his name's Jesus. That's why he's got to stay at the center. He's the only place that we see it is when Jesus breathes. So how, was, how, how did Christ forgive people? It was at the basis of his death and to be received by faith. And so what's this Jesus is our message method? The disciples are are to forgive on the basis of Christ's death and to be received by faith. So as the disciples declare Christ and his forgiveness in the power of the Spirit, the world's response to their message will be its response to Christ. Here's why this is important. And, and, And this may be taking me back to, to my roots of what I was raised in. See, when Jesus breathed, he breathed on them and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. Well, why would we need that? Because I don't think we could present the gospel message of Jesus without the Holy Spirit. I believe that the message of Jesus should be completely consumed and saturated by the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. If it is not, I'm not sure what message it is. And I'll, 
I'll go toe-to-toe with you and talk about this with you. If Jesus himself needed the Spirit of God to fill him, so that when he was tempted in the desert, why would we not need the Spirit of God to fill us? We need this. We have to keep the message of Jesus at the center of everything that we do and at the center of everything that we are. And so I'm going to unpack a familiar passage of Scripture. No, this wasn't in your notes. This was just free. The rest uh, you got to take notes on. <laughs> but I want to unpack a very familiar passage of Scripture It's where we see Jesus uh, interacting with sinners. See, with Jesus as our message, here's the deal. We're going to find ourselves going where Jesus went, and we're going to interact with the same people that Jesus interacted with. And church, we have to be ready for that. Because here's the deal. What happens when people show up in your church that don't believe like you, act like you, dress like you, think like you, talk like you, were raised like you? What are we representing? Are we representing who we are, or are we representing who He is? Because there's a distinct difference, right? Have you ever been around someone that challenges your thought, that challenges your theology, that challenges your doctrine? Can I tell you that Jesus challenged everyone's doctrine? Jesus challenged everyone's theology. In fact, you can go into John chapter 6 where he feeds the 5,000 and he fed them. So he met a physical need and then he taught them. And then he left and went to the other side of the sea and they followed around to be with him. And then they heard some hard truth. Well, what was Jesus saying to him? He was saying, I'm the bread of life. And it says in the Bible that they took issue with that statement. That, that the Jews that were present, they got upset with Jesus because he was claiming to be the bread of life. They said, how can this man be the bread of life? And I tell you that Jesus' theology and Jesus' doctrine could challenge everything that we've ever known. Think about, think about the, the audience that he was addressing. They were brought up on the Torah. They were brought up on the law. They knew everything about God through Moses' lens. But how many of you are grateful that Jesus is the greater Moses, that Jesus is the greater David, that Jesus is is, is the greater Andy? Are you getting this, this concept that Jesus changes everything? And some of us need some things changed about what we've held near and dear to our heart because it is not the message of the gospel. It is the message of what we've put together and packaged and hope that it presents well to somebody. The message of the gospel is that we are sinners, lost, in need of a Savior, and He sent one, and His name's Jesus. Amen? We good? Good stuff. So we've got to know how to interact with people. Why? Because I want to be a church that's filled with the grimiest of grimiest people. For real. Because if we are a church of cleaned up Christians that have been walking this for 20 years, we are no longer effective in the city that we're planted. See, this, this, this place and this space that God's called us to, to exist in, it's for both the sinner and the saved. But it's for the saved that are commissioned to go and reach those that are lost. I don't want us to ever get comfortable sitting in our salvation with our saved friends and we're okay with it. I'm never going to be okay with it. As long as people are dying and going to hell, we still have a job to do. Well, what's that job, John, to clean them up? No, it's to get them to the presence of God and let him do the cleaning. So how do you do it? (laughs) I mean, Jesus did it in a couple of ways. Let's look in Luke chapter 5. Verse 27, this is in your notes. It says, After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi. This is Matthew, Levi Matthew, sitting at his tax booth. This is a call of discipleship. Jesus says, Follow me. A Levi got up. Can you imagine that? You're just sitting, going through your everyday routine, doing whatever you're doing. And then Jesus walks by and he says, Follow me. I love that it doesn't go into great detail. So, <laughs> Levi got up. Like, was he bored that day? Was he done? Was he done cheating people? Because here's the deal about tax collectors. If you study your Bible, you'll know that that was like the worst of the worst. Like you could be seen with some people that do wrong, but you couldn't be seen with tax collectors. They were the worst of the worst. They stole from their own people. They were established by the the Roman Empire and put into place. They hired guys to, to charge a tax to give unto Caesar what's Caesar's, right? To render unto him what's his. But anything else, guess what? They'd keep. So if the tax was like 7% and I'm the tax collector and I see you hanging out and it's time to pay your taxes, it's 10% for you. I keep 3%. I make money off of my own people. They were sinners. They stole from people. They, they, they built their wealth off of their greed. Are you getting the picture of a tax collector? Here's the deal. We still have tax collectors today, and I'm not talking about the IRS or anything like that. Um, but what I am talking about is that there is distinct groups. Like, label the people however you want to label them. But we've just changed the label of tax collector to whatever other sin bothers us the most. So we won't be seen with fill in the blank with the kind of people that bother you the most. And I'll leave it at that. Is that not what we've done? Yeah, the gospel is good enough for this group, but not that group. 
It can't reach them in their sin. It can only reach me and my friends in ours. Like, there was a distinct line drawn, and so Jesus sees the line. He steps over it, and he's like, yo, Levi, follow me. Levi gets up, and he follows him. Left everything and followed him. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house. And a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect, they complained to his disciples, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, come on somebody, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. What does that tell me? As Jesus at the central core value of our message, guess who's going to get riled up by what we're doing? It is not the sinner looking for a savior. It is a religious mindset that is going to complain the whole time that sinners are coming in and getting well. You know, I wasn't going to say this, but I am. So this is your tweetable moment with John Dowdy. For real, like I'm about to, y'all pick up your feet. I'm about to step all over them. It amazes me that I have to prove my Christianity more to a Christian than I do a sinner who's lost, broken, looking for the answer. The only foolish debates I ever get into on social media, it's not with the sinner who's lost. Come on, put your feet back down. Let's step on them all together. The most foolish debates I find myself in is with other Christians. Well, John, how could you? And, and why would you? And, 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 and when Jesus is the center of your message, all of a sudden everything about you takes a back seat. Because he's got to be presented, and he's got to be, be, be made known. We don't do this to get famous on our own. We do this to make his name even more famous. Like, like I, I, Some of you have heard this story before, but I, I had a friend. Um, he was an older gentleman. I worked at Chick-fil-A in the mall. Shout out to Chick-fil-A. What's up? Half y'all in here work there, right? <laughs> How many people have worked at Chick-fil-A or are currently working at Chick-fil-A? Raise your hand. What's up? I knew the anointing of God was in this place. Forget Shoney's, yeah. <laughs> Check your time. Some people look at how long it takes me to, to say Shoney's. Um, I worked at Chick-fil-A in the mall. True story. And for the sake of privacy and confidentiality, I won't mention any names. But there was an older gentleman who, let's just put it this way, his sin was very apparent by his appearance. Are you guys tracking with me, or does anyone need me to be more specific? You need me to be more specific? It was a dude who had, um, he was, it, there was sexual identity confusion. Is that, is that clear? Okay. This man came to Chick-fil-A all the time, and we always gave him an ice cream. He loved ice cream. He was an older gentleman. And some of you may be able to picture this guy. He's, he's kind of known. He just walks around, and very, very nice guy. And, and so one day, I, I, had, I had my lunch break, and uh, I had just given him ice cream. And I was like, hey, man, like, can I sit with you and eat lunch with you? And he was like, yeah, sure. So I sat and I ate lunch with him. And, and, and please hear what I'm saying about God, not about me. It's, it's, it has nothing to do. I, I, would, I would hope that if you find yourself in the same situation, that you would do as Jesus did, and you would invite tax collectors and sinners to sit at a table with you and eat. Okay? Let's just get that out of the way. So I sat down with him, and I just started talking to him. And he said, uh, I'll be honest, I never thought you'd sit with me and eat because I know you. Yeah. And, uh, and I said, yeah, I, I don't know you um, per se as far as what got you here. I just know that, that obviously you, you've had some things happen in your life. And, and so we talked, and I got his story, and I, and I, and I got to um, But what really kind of like <laughs> messes with me even to this day is I got an email from some other pastor friends. You see, I was, I was bivocational. I was working and finishing Bible school. I was working in the church with student ministries and, and working at, at Chick-fil-A. So, so I, some people knew that I was in ministry. And I got an email, and the email was from one guy who had CC'd a couple of guys in on it. Has anyone ever got those kind of emails where you're about to get corrected? <laughs> and so it said, hey, uh, we just wanted you to know that we saw you sitting in the mall, and uh, we're just worried about your reputation and your witness for the gospel. So maybe take into consideration at tables you sit in in public. I tell you, man, my first response was like, well, the first response got deleted. 
in the second response and the third response, but I really had to, to, I had to search some things out. I was like, okay, God, like, like, what's this about, man? Like, Jesus is our message. What is this about? And eventually I responded. And I was like, hey, man, like, if I ever get caught in ministry, not surrounded by people that are struggling and broken and hurt, um, I'll turn in my resignation and be done with this thing. Because God didn't call me to sit around comfortable people that believe like me. God called us to go into the world and reach out for everyone who is sick, who is lost, who is broken, who is in their sin. See, like, here, we'll, we'll go. I'll give you a point. That's good. Um, when Jesus is our message, see, we meet people where they are, not where we're at. We meet them where they are, not where we're at. Remember, faith is a journey. Some of us have been on this journey a lot longer than others. We've all been recipients of God's grace, but some of us received it a lot longer, like, like, like a, a lot earlier in the journey. And so we meet people where they are. It's exactly what Jesus did in verse 27. Jesus went out and he saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. So to put this in context for why this is important to us, what it is saying is that Jesus saw a man sitting in the middle of his sin and his mess and Jesus met him where he was. See, like the way that we reduce the gospel to make it comfortable for us would almost like be to read, um, after this, Jesus went out and saw the tax collector weeping at the altar, getting his life right, and then he says, come follow me. Friends, that's not the gospel. See, Jesus met people in the middle of their mess. Are you thankful that Jesus meets us in the middle of our mess? It's in the middle and in the moment of brokenness that Jesus meets us right there. There is no requirements or jump through this hoop or go to this class or attend this many times before you can receive God's grace. He meets us right in the middle of the mess. I am so thankful that in the middle of my mess was the presence of God's grace. That in the middle of my mess was the presence of my Savior. That in the middle of my mess was the person of Jesus Christ. It is in the middle of the mess that the sinner, the lost, the broken, can come to the acknowledgement of something is off and I need this. There's, there's this longing and this desire. You see it with the prodigal son, right? Like in the middle of his mess, literally in the middle of a mess. He was in the pigsty, like, like arguing and, and thinking about taking their food because it looked, looked appealing. That's the moment of salvation. It wasn't when the prodigal son came to the father. It's when he realized he needed the father. See, this faith is a journey. We meet people where they're at, not where we are. He didn't wait for him to get things together and to come to him. He went to them. If we were a church that went to people that don't have it together, then we would be a church filled with people that don't have it together. And I'm completely comfortable with that. Some of us have been so comfortable with everything going right that at the moment someone walks in who reeks of alcohol, who doesn't dress like you think they should dress, who doesn't talk the way you think they should talk. Man, on the back of that wall, what does it say, Anthony? You're standing there. You belong here. That is an open statement for anyone. It is not a qualifying statement for only some. If our church is not filled with broken people, guys, we've just become a country club. So if you're saved, awesome. Go find some people that need saving. And eat dinner with them. And sit at tables with them. And meet them where they are. Because you'd be amazed at how many people would open up to you about their life when you meet them in the middle of their mess. Golly, man. When Jesus is our message, we're, we're commissioned and commanded to go and do likewise. To meet people at different places. Another instance, we see Jesus heading into a town, the city of Nain, where he meets someone in the middle of their mess. We meet people where they are. Luke 7, 12. Speaking of Jesus, it says, As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, and he said, Don't cry. See, Jesus meets this woman in the middle of her pain, in the middle of her sorrow. Maybe you find yourself in a season similar to this. You know, I, I love that with, with simple, comforting words. Aren't you thankful that Jesus uses comforting words? 
He says, woman, don't cry. Moved with compassion. The next steps that he takes uh, would have flipped everyone's beliefs upside down. He's a rabbi. Guess what rabbis don't do? They don't touch dead things. You know what Jesus did next? (laughs) He touched the dead body. And he brought it back to life. We serve a Savior who is not afraid to touch dead things, bringing back to life. Why can he do it? Because he defeated death, hell, and the grave. Some of us have dead areas of our lives that need to be brought back. Well, who does it? Well, Jesus does. Well, how do we connect people with that? Well, simple. Keep Jesus at the the central point of your message. It's all about Jesus. We meet people where they're at, not where we are. (laughs) Or, Or better yet, not where we want them to be. Like this discipleship commitment, right? Like it's a process. You can't just put it on a time frame. Six weeks, you'll be a disciple. Sign up. Think about it. Jesus spent intentional time with 12 men, and at the end of his ministry, they still had no clue who he was. It's going to take time, y'all. It's not just a one and done type deal. Like, like I'm, I'm, I'm interested in seeing the sinner come to the saving knowledge of Christ, but I'm even so much more interested in the day after, and the day after, and the day after, and the day after, and the day after. It's this commitment. And when Jesus is at our message, we're committing to people that are in the middle of their mess. Are you okay with that, friend? If not, I'll lead you to another scoop of ice cream. It'll be okay. The next thing when we really unpack this is, so Jesus meets people where they're at, Another thing that happens is our reputation, it's got to take a back seat. It's got to take a back seat to the need that's at hand. That's why I ate lunch with a guy that no one else would sit with at a table that believed like I believe. I mean, that's what he told me. He was like, I, he was like, I, know, I know what you think about my lifestyle. I said, okay. <laughs> Tell me about it, man. Let's talk. See, our reputation takes a back seat. In Luke 5, 27, when Jesus said, follow me, Levi got up, he throws a party for him. They go to a banquet, a large crowd, tax collectors and others were eating. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who, be, who belong to the sect, they complained, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And in, in Luke chapter 7, 34, uh, the, it's quoted as saying, the son of man, he came eating and drinking. And you say, here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. See, let me make one thing clear. Before I unpack this reputation taking a back seat, um, our reputation is important. It's biblical, okay? I'm, I'm not just saying that, that recipients of grace live just loose and weird. That's not the message of grace. It's, it's not. There's a false message of grace that is preached from pulpits that people buy into that says that God can change everything about you, but you don't have to change anything. Just keep living how you are. Grace changes us. It draws us to deeper convictions and in, in, in who Christ is as we go on this faith journey and we understand him more. But, but it's, it's several verses that talk about the importance of a good name and reputation. For example, I'm going to give you some. Proverbs 22.1, it says, A good name is more desirable than great riches. To be esteemed is better than silver or gold. Essentially what's being said in Proverbs is that we're not to trade our names or our character for any riches that the world could give. It's not saying that we won't be successful in our business adventures, but what it is saying is that don't put your reputation and your name aside in exchange for the treasures of the world. Does that make sense? We see in 1 Timothy 3, 7, speaking of elders, it says he must also have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. This shows us that our reputation is a testimony to others. So again, I'm not saying that a reputation isn't a good thing to have. I mean, it's biblical to, to keep a good name. But what I'm saying is when people are hurt, lost, and broken and needing something, our reputation takes a back seat to the need at hand. So yeah, a reputation and a good name are important. But here's the deal. If, we, if, if what we are after is just to have a good name before all men, we might end up becoming people pleasers who want a perfect reputation but have no impact for the kingdom of God. I don't want a perfect reputation with no impact for the kingdom of God. See, here's the deal. When you're, you're, we said this earlier about someone that's attending church. Is your, your talent may get you there, but it's your character that will keep you there. Right? And, and, and so your character and your reputation speaks for itself. It's the track record of who you are. You know, like, like honestly, like people, people that, that, that know me, like, like really know me and have, have been around me for years, had you seen me sitting at a table in the mall with someone 
that was less than deserving of God's grace, if you will. If you guys saw me sitting there, what would you think? <laughs> hey, there's John. See, you, you, your reputation, it takes a back seat when we put others', others needs first. Jesus' reputation was fully intact when he took on the position of a servant. And he washed his disciples' feet, John 13, 4 through 5. It says he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin, and he began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. See, Jesus removes the, 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 the appearance of his authority, but he never leaves his reputation. It goes with him, but he takes on the, the form of a servant. Does that make sense? So sometimes we get so comfortable in our authority or in our robe that we don't know what it feels like to wrap ourselves in a towel and to actually serve somebody else. See, Jesus' reputation was intact. He had an incredibly good name. But he set all that aside to serve someone else. I wonder what would happen if Church of the Cross, and guess what I want our reputation to be in our city? That we're a church for the sick to find healing. That we're a church for those that are hurt can come in in the middle of their hurt and we'll still love on them. See, here's the deal, and this is with Jesus at the center of our message, and I'll close with this, is every opportunity, it turns towards eternity when Jesus is at the center of our values. Luke 5.31, Jesus answered them, It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. See, Jesus' life was about the ones who are sick and far from him. This is our message. We're a church that exists for the ones far from him. As recipients of his grace and his mercy and his forgiveness, we're in position to lead others to the same peace that we found in him. That's what this thing is all about. God's always called us to be a people, not just a person. I don't want saved people to just be saved and sit on it on your own. I want saved people to be activated and commissioned into their city and into their community to bring some grimy people up in this church. You want to grow a church? I don't want to grow it with other members of other churches. I want to grow it with broken people who are in need of a savior. If they come into a place that they hear the gospel message presented and they find out that, that, that they're in need of a savior, guess what? It's their response response to that message, it's the response to Christ, not to us. Sometimes the response is anger, right? Like, like when you're confronted with grace, sometimes it makes you mad. Not just at yourself, but even at the one trying to give the grace to you. you know, that's what guilt and shame does. You can be sitting in the, in the middle of your mess and, and someone comes along and they're like, yeah, let's, let's go grab some food, it's okay. You could be so angry I mean, think about that. When Jesus showed up, there was a bunch of different emotional responses. And I don't want to be the response that's so angry by Jesus that I go home and I discuss everything I don't like about the message. Who does Jesus, who does Church the Crossing think they are? Letting so-and-so go to their church. Who does that pastor think he is eating with so-and-so? Who does that person think they are. They know where they were last night. And now they're going to sit in that church. Yo, I wonder if the pastor's going to call them out on that post they made on Instagram. Yo, let the religious talk while the broken are healed. Let them talk. We all have friends right now that we can think of that need to receive God's grace. We can unpack the message of grace. We're recipients of it. That's why our whole vision statement is that we exist to participate in moments of grace. Is that we will, I'll teach grace until the cows come home. Because it was by that grace I was saved. The crazy thing about being overwhelmed by God's grace is it almost hits you in waves. You know what I'm saying? Like at first it's like this, God, you are good. I'm not really that good, but you are. And then that next overwhelming wave of grace hits. It's like, man, something's off in my life. And then you get hit with more grace. It's, man, like something's got to change. See, grace changes us. It shows us the person of Jesus. And as recipients of this grace, we're commissioned to go and let others be a part of it too. I mean, honestly, in 2019, 
we've prayed over this and we like, God, what's next for the crossing? What are you doing? Where do you want us to go? And I'll be honest with you, man, I think for some of us, this is going to be a, a, a season to step our game up when it comes to our own faith. We may have to swallow our own pride. We may have to swallow everything that, that we know and say, okay, God, I'm committing to you. Because a commitment to him is, 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 is life-changing. I believe in 2019 for us as a church, we are going to see God continue to do incredible things. We all got to partake in that message together. Bow your heads with me. So Jesus is the only message. He's the only way. 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The fact is, is that the wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life. Some of us are sitting dead in our sin. And someone's, someone's going to pay. It's either going to be us and we're going to experience eternal separation from God or it's going to be Jesus who's the atonement for our sin who paid the price that we couldn't pay on our own so that in exchange we could receive the righteousness of Christ. We will all stand before him and all face a day of judgment. And what I'm hoping for everyone present is that you hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter in. So we've got to be recipients of this grace. And to do that, it's an acknowledgement of our need of our Savior. At the core of our belief is repentance. It's to change one's mind, to turn, our, 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 to turn from our own way, to acknowledge our need of a Savior. If you're sitting in here this morning and you've never come to the saving knowledge of Christ, maybe you've worked to receive this grace that He freely gives. You're like, John, all you're telling me is that it's a decision, it's an acknowledgement, it's repenting. Yeah, that's the first step. <laughs> if you're in here today and you want to acknowledge your need of a Savior and give your life to Him. I'm not going to ask you to repeat a prayer after me. I'm not going to ask you to come down. I simply want you to raise your hand and put it down. It's just my way of acknowledging you and uh, celebrating with you. The Bible tells us that eternity changes for others. We celebrate together. Is there anyone present? John, that's me. If we all find ourselves in good standing in our relationship with Christ, <laughs> maybe it's this commitment to say, okay, John, I get it now. Jesus is our message. I haven't been the best example of His grace and His mercy on my life to others. Would you pray for me? Would you pray for me going into this new year? Hands already gone up in the back, hands in the front. Dear Heavenly Father, I see the response to you, not to us. God, I pray that as we become recipients of more of your grace, that we in exchange go and invite others to receive it as well. Father, we love you and we thank you. It's in your son's name. Amen and amen. Would you stand with us? Let's finish out with a chorus. Lead us in whatever you're playing.
Heavenly Father, I'm so thankful that you never let us down, God. I pray that as we go our separate ways, that you'll give us even more opportunities to participate in moments of your grace. Father, we love you. We thank you, and it's in your name. Amen and amen. Guys, next week, we're following up with our next value, and it's about community being our passion. I would ask you to pray over this next week. Man, who is so far gone that they, they, they could... They could uh, they could benefit from seeing a change in community because community is one thing. Healthy community is a whole different thing, and we'll talk about that next week. We love you guys. If you need anything, I'm up front. Love y'all.